All right. Uh, can I get your name? And if you'll spell your last name, please. My name is Sue Ann Olson, O-L-S-O-N. And Ms. Olson, were you in the room earlier when I went through the penalties for perjury? Yes. And do you understand what perjury is? Yes. And being advised of the potential penalties for perjury, do you promise to tell the truth in this case today? I will. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, commissioners, um, my name is um, Representative Sue Ann Olson. I'm a CPA, and I've spent my career working with all types of business entities. <coughs> I think that it's important that the PSC understand and consider who the beneficial owners of Summit Carbon Solutions are. And you might ask, why do we care who the owners are? To answer that question, let's roll all the way back to what an LLC is and why businesses choose to operate as an LLC. Compared to corporations, LLCs, which are limited liability companies, are relatively new. Wyoming was the first state to authorize LLCs in 1977, and most other states passed LLC legislation in the mid-1990s, including North Dakota, in 1993. I would guess that most new business entities that are formed today are formed as LLCs. Why is that? Well, there are several reasons. They offer flexibility. LLCs are generally taxed as partnerships, and they have broad discretion in how income, deductions, and tax credits are allocated among the LLC members. Their owners can be anyone. Other corporations, LLCs, partnerships, trusts, or individuals. LLCs offer one level of taxation. As I said, they're most often treated as partnerships, and that means that those income, deductions, and tax credits pass out to the underlying owners. A corporation, on the other hand, pays tax at the corporate level, and shareholders pay tax again when money or property comes out of the corporation. LLCs essentially pay tax at just the owner level. LLCs offer limited liability. For most investors, they cannot be called upon to contribute more money into the LLC beyond their original contribution unless they have agreed to it in the beginning. Now, these factors would be very important to Summit's operation. Their activities are driven by the federal tax credit under Code Section 45Q. At full capacity, as noted on Summit's website, they could generate $1.5 billion of tax credits per year. These credits can be a direct pay from the federal government, regardless of the member's ability to use the credits against their own U.S. income tax liability for up to five of the 12 years of the credit. The credits can also be sold to others. The LLC has tremendous flexibility in how they claim, allocate, or sell those credits. Limited liability is also extremely important to Summit investors. Limited liability means that liabilities of the company can't trace through to the owners. The only thing investors can lose is their original contribution. The impact of limited liability is incredibly important to our North Dakota citizens and to the state of North Dakota if there is a catastrophic failure. Who will be responsible for the damage to life and property? An LLC can be a pretty empty pocket. Most of us think in terms of Main Street businesses. If something goes wrong, the business has to stand behind their product or service, right? In terms of pipelines, we are most familiar with pipelines that our local utilities own. We know where their place of business is. Many of us may drive by it every day. We know that if there is a problem, even decades after a pipeline has been placed in service, we can actually stop by their office to seek a resolution. This type of business also has other assets that are at risk if the company fails to fulfill its promise of safe operation. A publicly traded corporation, like the PSC probably normally deals with, also has the additional check and balance of being accountable to its shareholders. This may not be the case with Summit. Unless the affected, affected states require a significant bond against a catastrophic event, there may not be anyone to turn to as a remedy. 
I would envision that very little capital will, will be retained in the entity. Some undisclosed portion of Summit's underlying owners appear to be private equity investors. Private, private equity investors are typically promised a particular return on investment. Therefore, cash that is not needed to pay for easements, construction, and operating costs will be distributed to the investors. And since this is an LLC, the underlying owners cannot in most cases be required to come up with cash to pay a settlement for damages. I think this may be particularly true after the 12 years of the tax credit have expired. At that point, most of the investors will likely roll out of the entity with just a shell remaining as the owner. For example, one of the disclosed investors, Summit Agricultural Group, highlights past investments that they got in and out of within a five-year time frame. At least several of the currently disclosed investors' websites indicate that they are utilizing private equity funds. These funds usually have a targeted duration at the onset. They are not in it for the long haul. Clearly, North Dakota needs to understand how our citizens are made whole if the project has a failure. Members of the commission, if it hasn't already been provided, you should request and review any and all prospectuses that are utilized to attract investors. A, pros a prospectus typically explains the business, operations, and expected timeline of an investment and would provide a great deal of useful information. Are there other reasons why it matters who the owners are? Well, yes. The state recognizes that foreign ownership of North Dakota property may be a threat. That's why House Bill 1135 and Senate Bill 2371 passed by wide margins in the legislature and were signed into law by the governor. Make no mistake, a 99-year easement is an acquisition of a property right, and allowing such a pipeline to potentially fall under foreign control is something we should be very cautious about. Interestingly, the federal government is also aware that they don't know enough about potential bad actors doing business in the U.S. The Corporate Transparency Act was passed in 2021 with final rules issued early this year. Starting in 2024, most businesses will have to report their owners to the federal government. The two bills that were passed by our legislature are a start in this direction too, and the legislature plans to continue studying foreign ownership in the interim. Given the enormity of this project, it only makes sense for North, for North Dakota to be very clear and very intentional about whom we are dealing with. This is why the Attorney General has been asked to investigate who the owners of Summit Carbon Solutions are. And I have just a couple of observations. As a CPA, I you know, would always promise my clients I would, I would tell them what I think. They didn't have to listen, but I was, felt obligated to tell them. Um, you know, under 45Q, I think somebody earlier had stated it, but January 1st, 2033 is, is the deadline for starting construction in order to get the 12 years of credits. Um, it, it certainly feels like to me that, that, that this project has been presented with a great deal of urgency that there just isn't time to, um, to take a very measured and careful approach, and, and that um, seems odd to me. Um, I think the potential for foreign ownership is something we need to be very careful about, um, just from an economic standpoint, and I know that's beyond this scope, but um, you know, we're taking federal money, it's our taxpayer money essentially, or will eventually when we pay for it, um, to send money as is credit to the investors. And, and to the extent it's foreign money, it just rankles. Because at least if money stayed in the U.S., there would be some turnover of those dollars and there would be some additional economic benefit. And when we're sending money to foreign owners, I mean, that just isn't the case. Um, and there's just, you know, real... Um, uh, my concern about it being an LLC with nobody really being responsible because certainly in all the tax planning I've done, I mean, it, you layer, you know, one LLC on top of another, and you make it so hard that you can't really get to the ultimate owner who, who might actually have a pocket that could make things right. And, um, and we seem to be focusing a lot on the economics, but, but there is real danger in, um, in what, what this pipeline is. And um, 
The other piece that was handed out to you was some information that had been, been requested by a law firm here in town uh, related to a, a CO2 pipeline not nearly as big as, as what we're talking here, but the, you'll see the pictures, which are quite telling. This is on a ranch in Montana where they've had a number of failures um, you know, that have happened over, I think, a period of several years. So to, to think somehow that it isn't possible that there's a breach somewhere, and, and it may not be someone punching a hole, but um, you know, whoever builds this pipeline is also hiring contractors. We all know the problem with hiring good people. Um, if there's a poor weld somewhere, I mean, that, that, that it's hard to predict where. I mean, there's, there's so much threat that can happen um, with this that to think that it just isn't possible that there would be a failure um, doesn't seem to be borne out. I'm, I'm sure that people in this project were quite certain there wouldn't be a failure either, and yet on this ranch they've had multiple, um, I mean, you can hardly describe it differently than, you know, explosions almost, um, what they've done to the, um, to the property. Um, that this is real, and, um, and the fact that I think it would be quite easy um, in, in how they, they're set up, that there's no one really um, that will become terribly accountable for this, um, just by nature of who the owners are and how you set these things up. So I feel like this was valid information um, for you also to think about um, as we move forward. So that would conclude my statement. All right, thank you. Mr. Bender, any questions? No questions. Mr. Pelham? No questions, thank you. Mr. Jordy, any questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, would you agree that it would be irresponsible for this commission to approve this application until and unless they know all of the beneficial owners and the layers of ownership so they know exactly who they would be permitting? Oh, I think that um, absolutely should happen. Um, and again, the, um, when you're talking private equity investors, there, there's a prospectus out there. There may be several um, that talks about the expected, how long these people are in or whatever. But um, to really have an understanding, who is the planned owner? And not that they can even entirely predict that with real accuracy. But if they're promising all investors, oh, hey, in 12 years you get out, it starts telling you who's left. And, and there would be nothing, really no assets, no, nothing to help, um, you know, cover a, a problem that might have, might pop up. Would you be surprised to learn that their private placement memorandum has an exit strategy of five to seven years? Well, it doesn't surprise me. I knew, I, I figured it shouldn't be longer than 12, the 12 years of the credit. And, and are you aware that they, in their own discretion, could sell uh, any portion of the entity and any landowner subjected to it would have a new pipeline owner that they may not know anything about? Yeah, I mean, tip, I, again, I would guess that the documents allow for a transfer of the, the easement, so yes. And, and the exhibit that you passed around, um, is it your understanding that the, these are depicting... Uh, ruptures of, of CO2 and then the after effect of, of CO2 rupture on, in the ground and the soil? Yes, I mean, this is, this is Montana property, so I don't know exactly what the whole thing looked at, looked like um, pre-breach, um, but they're rather startling and uh, wouldn't make you think that you could use that particular piece of ground for anything afterwards. I mean, there's no grass, there's nothing for grazing, um, yeah, it looks like it's, you know, the moon. I, I, I paged through all these photos and I didn't see any first responders. I didn't see anyone from the pipeline company here to address this. Do you have any idea where, where they were after these breaches? I don't. And, and you can see the cover letter that went with that. Um, they had requested a great deal of information from, um, from Montana. Um, okay. you know, and luckily these things are out where there aren't, there's not a population, and this wasn't a big line, so we weren't talking um, anything that would come close to, I'm sure, the size of a 24-inch pipe. Uh, but it has, a, it has an effect when, if there's a breach, for sure. Would you purchase a property in or near um, a, a CO2 
pipeline similar to this, similar to what's proposed here, knowing what you know and the obvious evidence that we have before us? Well, no. When you look at those pictures, when you look at the, gr what the ground, what would you use it for? <laughs> I mean, that it has, it has no agricultural value, I would say, at that point, and certainly no one would want to actually live in those areas. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Brocky, any questions? No questions. Commissioner Chrisman? I don't have any questions. Thank you, Representative Olson, for being here. And I'll take this opportunity since I neglected it. That's something I try and always do. I neglected both you and Senator Magrum as well. So a call out to you as well. Uh, thank you for being here on an issue that's important to your constituents. Commissioner Haugen Hoffert? No questions, but thank you so much for being here, Representative. And Mr. Dawson? No questions. Thank All right, thank you.